Yep, that's all I have. Unless there's a question. Okay. Was, was there some problem with the uh, grate outlet over the Sierra Madre Dam? Was that, I saw it open for a while and then closed for a while. We try to keep that up and out of the way so hikers, whatever, cannot access that tunnel. We don't really mm -hmm. want people going up through there. Um, I mean, there is, there's signs from trespassing, it's county facilities, so yeah, we don't really want. So it should be closed. Should be folded up and out, of, yeah. Right. Uh, if there, uh, during a rain, we do have to open it when there's a potential for rain, or we try to remember to open it because it'll just blow off and then, then we have a repair. So, okay. yeah, yeah, we try to keep it closed during the summer um, and then open during the rain season. Okay. Um, what's your procedure on the storm drains? I noticed I live on the corner of uh, Stonehouse and Liliano, and when the mud came off the Stonehouse property, all the storm drains get clogged up really quickly with the with the palm tree uh, prawns and you know we have the rescue <coughs> search and rescue right there on the corner um, it makes sense that those drains should be cleaned out as often as possible in order to let things flow but those got clogged up immediately and then it causes more of a, a, a back you talk about the catch basin right yeah, the yeah. yeah the, the it, storm drain again there's not there's not much really we can do about it in an event like this where you have a burn area or an area where there's a, a high debris level that does exactly that, plug up the catch basin, I mean, you know, because that's everywhere. Uh, all, the, all the foothill cities go through that, so I would just say if you, if you see that and then tap in, just call, call us and let us know and so we can respond to it. I mean, we have search and rescue right there on the corner. I don't know if it makes sense to have them there's clean not, that out. There's nothing much we can do during the rain. It's really almost impossible to clean it out or to try to unplug it during the rain, unless it's just right the immediate front. Yeah, right. I'm talking about the immediate front. Okay. That was what's happening is the debris is blocking so nothing can get inside. Okay. It's not that the, the, the catch... Well, that, that would, should be, we can respond to and then clear out if it's... You know, I don't um, know if it makes sense to have a procedure set up to do that automatically as it starts raining in order to kind of get the flowing going. I mean, that's the whole point is to redirect all this mud flow down the, down the hill down into the storm drain, having that front cover is not going to help you. So. And I don't know in the city of Santa Monica if they're all our catch basins or all the city it's catch basins. It's a mix. Some so of yeah, some of them that works. Yeah. You know, a lot of times we'll get the call and we'll go do it anyways, but if we know it's not ours, we'll refer it to the city, or if the city knows it's not, you know, they'll refer it to us. So there's also a aspect there as whose responsibility is it to clear. Right in the back. Yeah, uh, you said that you, your engineering group, they've gone in, they've assessed the part, and they're going to put in rails and timber. Will they also go into Stonehouse and assess? I know that we have the nine 1,500-gallon tanks buried in the ground of free-flowing water. Will they put the rails and timber behind or in front of those so that that won't break loose with the water and join in with the mud flows? Okay, what we're planning on doing is, yes, there is a timber and rails structure that is proposed for the Stonehouse property. It's not proposed for that upper end of the property. It's proposed further down, closer to the actual street. Um, we are, uh, Mr. Stone and city staff are planning on meeting later this week with the, the owner of the property to get the go-ahead from them to start working on both the Stonehouse and the Carter properties. Yeah, I know that's mountain spring water, and that's free flowing, so maybe there should be two sets of rail and timber. I just kind of see that we might get extra water coming. Well, at this point, it's, we're not completely finished with the evaluation of the site yet. Okay. All right. Keep in mind that the rail and timber structures don't hold any water at all. No, but there's such a huge amount of water on that poppy that's just been discovered. I don't know if that would contribute to the amount of rain that we'll be also receiving that would make it... Probably not. It probably won't make it any worse. I mean, what you're really looking at is a high intense rainfall that falls on a burned watershed that has the capability of moving a large amount of sediment very quickly. And uh, I don't think that would be a major consideration. The location that we're proposing appears to us to be the, the best location for that type of structure, and it will provide uh, a significant amount of protection below that. Have you assessed those nine tanks that are buried in the ground? I'll have to go back and ask my 
staff or my engineer in the field that I, I don't know that I can't answer that. Thank you. Um, it appears that from from everything that you put together, it sounds like a great plan. But if we get a major storm running through Southern California, you guys are just going to get swamped. Yep. Sure. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and a major storm, as we periodically see. Uh, I have a question, and then I have, I have another one, too, related to it. Do you have any remote sensing devices located anywhere um, so that you could strategically place, so that you could monitor activity, <coughs> or at least uh, gather data without having to go everywhere at one time? Because it could break anywhere in which you need to strategically the only remote uh, sensors that we have are really the rain gauges that we and we call them alert gauges, but they are um, they instantaneously give us feedback on the rainfall occurring all across the county, and we have over 140 of those throughout the county. So as the storm season uh, storm starts moving into the county, typically from the west, right. we'll we will we'll have our people will be activated long before it ever gets there, and they'll start watching those rainfall gauges and see what type of the rainfall intensities they're getting and, and the quantities that are coming in and that helps us start planning uh, along with flood maintenance where, where we need to start uh, you know moving people to to get ready for it. The follow-up question to that is because rain is one element but how much is actually sinking in are there any instruments that can gauge uh, how much moisture is in the ground the hydrology? Well what, what we've done you know we've done a significant amount of engineering work on determining uh, mud flow potential and what's a projected runoff from this and this is through uh, scientific tests we've taken the infiltrometer test and we've done those throughout, throughout the county so we have a pretty good idea of how much uh, water will actually go into the ground two things to keep in mind though uh, typically you know when you see a large problem developing there's two scenarios that you need to be aware of again is and again part of it is this hydrophobic soils condition, which really seals off water from penetrating it at all. And then the other scenario is, is as you all know, uh, when we get storm events, they typically roll in here about every three or four days you're getting another storm to where you, you get to a saturated condition. So whether it's hydrophobic soils or a saturated condition, you're going to get a lot of runoff. And then the, the, the last question, sorry, is if we get a tremor or an earthquake, is this area hypersensitive now? I have not heard that that is a, an additional concern because of the uh, because of the burned area yes. being burned. I have not heard anyone ever say that. Thank you. No, but there could be a concern on breakage of water mains, including oh, yeah. if the big one hit the southern San Andreas. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to say there's not going to be any damages or whatever because we, we're worried about our own structures, whether it's Sierra Madre Dam or whatever. If you have a a big enough event, you, you can suffer some severe damages all, all across the city. Well, an MWD isn't here, so yeah, they're the ones that have to address that uh, water main under I, I, have, I have a question myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sorry, I have an answer to our water mains, not MWD. The city's going to answer for our water mains. Yeah, but there's an arena event and the cubic yardage coming in. No, what's, the the city, rainfall, right? place? what's the rainfall from those predictions? What's the amount of rainfall from those predictions? Like you say, a storm event or? Again, what those, those projections of the, the debris quantities are, what we calculate the debris potential on is a basically a, what we call a 10-year storm event, meaning that it has a recurrence interval of every 10 years. That's what we project to see that size of storm once every 10 years on a watershed that's had two years of recovery after a fire. So those debris quantities, they seem huge, but I mean, we're talking about the first year coming up, and we're talking about what if you get a 50-year event? What if you get a 25-year event, which is going to be significantly more material coming off those watersheds than what's projected here? Um, two questions. How many years do you feel like this might be going on, and two, are we relying, relying on nature to receive hillsides with greenery and to kind of mitigate the situation? 
what we've projected, I'm sorry, Bruce, okay. Okay. what we've projected, typically it takes about five years for a watershed to recover. And then I'll let okay. answer the other uh, The question of, of seeding the slopes has come up repeatedly. And it's a conversation that we have had with uh, the National Resources Conservation Service, the Forest Service, uh, both of those agencies, and actually there's representatives here tonight that could even speak to that from the Forest Service. Um, we don't find that artificially seeding these burn areas is necessarily a benefit, uh, particularly in areas that are as steep as the hillsides are in Sierra Madre, the stuff's going to just roll off. Uh, it's not going to provide, and what it will provide is a false sense of security. Um, one of the things that I've also applied for is uh, rather than seeding these areas, I applied for, uh, I made an initial application to OAS for uh, grant funding to do hydro mulching on two of these burn areas to try and keep as much of that stuff up there as possible. That uh, notice of intent was also turned down. I'm one for three on these things. I, the third one that I applied for was actually approved and I was notified of that today. That is uh, the first round in a grant process uh, that we won't have results on until August, but the first round of grant, grant uh, application was approved for well over a million dollars for implementation of these barriers. Uh, K-rail purchases and placement and some of those things, sandbagging and those kinds of expenses the city isn't really set up or equipped to handle, we've, we've made it through the first round of grant application on that. So, uh, and I am continuing to work with the National Resources Conservation Service. Uh, when they came out the week after the fire, they, uh, one of the first discussions we had was about the seating and they said, no, you don't want to do this. Um, and as they looked at each one of these burn areas with us, at the end of our meeting they said, well, this is the kind of thing that we help with, but all of our money is going to, still going towards New Orleans these days. They also said that they class uh, their hazardous areas in, in two classes, exigent, meaning these are an immediate life-threatening hazard, and non-exigent, which is well, they're a hazard, and they're life-threatening, but they're not immediate. So they classed all those Sierra Madre's burn areas as non-exigent, which puts us way down on their grant processes. After the rainfall event, I called them, said, hey folks, does this move us up the ladder just a little bit? And they said, yes, absolutely. And they came out and met with me again uh, last week, and we've been moved up on their, their list of, of possibilities. Still no guarantees. Uh, they have limited funds just like all the rest of us do, but we're, we're, getting, we're looking a little bit better in terms of getting some outside help. Yes? Um, do you have a contingency plan for the timber and uh, rail system if the property owner on one quarter and Stonehouse doesn't allow you to do it? At this point, we might have to take the, the, the route of declaring a public nuisance, but that's that's further down track. We're not to that point yet. But we haven't ruled it out. I'm not. No, I'm not ruling that out. Anybody else with any questions? Yes. The, are the what do you call it, key rails? Uh -huh. are those are those lines that we see, right? Kind of lime green or light blue. Well, some of them, well, those are just labels right now, but you'll see up there if you go up and look at it closely, it'll say either K-Rail on it, okay. Rail and Timber, or the name of a facility. Is it dependent on the money that Mr. Inman uh, is applying for? Is, how can I say it? Are we only going to get those made if we get the money? There's a potential that that will be the case, yes. We are also following up on the potential for borrowing that kind of stuff, too. I've been in touch with the district director for District 7 of Caltrans. He's putting me in touch with uh, the people at Caltrans that, uh, I guess the county's been able to borrow K-Rail from, from Caltrans in the past, and we're going to try the same thing. City of Laverne has offered us K-Rail. trick there is getting it from here to there and vice versa. It's, not the kind of stuff you put in the back of your Taurus and drive over to your water. <laughs> so there's, there's an expense even there. It's not just the, the stuff is, is absolutely free. And you kind of want to set up 
before the rains yeah. come. <laughs> you know, yeah, you want to be worried about it after or during. And even if we do get it, you have they have to get the money before you build it. And you're talking about the timber ground thing. Yeah. T typically, the way NRCS uh, works <clears throat> is they'll approve approve your project, but it's a reimbursable type grant. Or so you actually have to go out, build it. They come out and inspect it to make sure it meets their guidelines. <laughs> after they review the design, the design documents you build it, they come out and review it, see if it matches up with what they approved, and then they reimburse it for the cost. That's the way it's set up. So would we need mezzanine funding or something like that to carry us through, or temporary funding before we got to make in order to build it? Yeah, I think you're you're, you're right. You're, we would need some sort of funding, and in, in some ways that. You know, the fire guys are here, they're more familiar with, with dealing with this kind of issue and funding disasters, but we don't wait to put the fire out to see if we've got the money first. Mm -hmm. And to the extent we can, we're going to try and deal with this uh, before, you know, before we have the money. But again, we can't, we're not in a position to just be able to write a blank check. We still don't know how much the fire is going to cost the city. And it may be months before we have that answer. Question about the science of the water going over the uh, the seal, the sealing effect of the fire. The water flows down from above, and then it gets saturated in areas where it hasn't been burned. Is that where the mud uh, is created? Well, <clears throat> if you get enough runoff, it can actually start scouring away to to where you break through that hydrophobic layer. But it's on the upper parts of the watershed, not in the drainage area itself or the drainage river itself or the channel itself, I mean that part you're going to have such high velocities and, and rocks moving that it, it's going to just break up it whatever, breaks it up, and, breaks it up and, and exactly. And so it's just flowing over up, way up high and then it just breaks it up down below. Yes, yeah. right. Okay. Is there any critical analysis of potential landslide? Uh, landslide, how would you, you differentiate chunk, that? Oh, a chunk of the hillside coming down. Do you use that something? Breaking off. Yes. Only, only to the extent where it's a map geological hazard, that would, information would already be available. And I don't know, I haven't looked into that, that area of it. As far as a, a true landslide itself. Okay. Others? The um, hydrophobic, is that what you call it? Is that where the rain comes to the... Can you explain that briefly? Well, what happens when vegetation burns, it leaves kind of a waxy material left on top of the soil itself. <laughs> okay. So it really is just underneath the ashes that are left. And it can, and it can be permute, it, it can be as much as, you know, one to three inches deep. And then you get back to the native soil again. So, so if the water comes down, it kind of creates this... Run, it just off. runs off. It's like a wax layer almost on, on the top of the soil. Is so. there anything that can be done to mit to prevent that, or mitigate that? If someone, if, you know, anything can be done to go up the mountain now and get stuff out. Well, is it worse than water hitting? I so. mean, the extent of the burned area is so huge. I mean, we <laughs> couldn't really go through and scarify the, all the surfaces to make sure you broke that broke up that that uh, hydrophobic soil layer. And again, is that are those? Uh, uh, fire intensity maps. Is that what you have? No, that's slope intensity. Slope intensity. And again, you know, the, the, the extent of the uh, hydrophobic soil layer is really dependent on the intensity of the burn. And I'm not sure what the intensity factor was up in this area. You can, you know, it varied. Varied, yeah, what which is kind of typical. The intensity, the intensity of the light. fire? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> of the channel itself, the pipeline from the existing county debris basin is intact. It is continuous from the debris basin all the way down through Sierra Madre. Uh, the new debris basin over below the West Ridge is not complete yet, although the pipe, I believe, is complete up to that. So that will drain. Um, what is not complete in the, in the overall system is we required, and the county required, that 
the re relocated main pipeline out of that canyon have a clarifier installed. Uh, it's part of meeting federal clean water standards. That clarifier hasn't been installed yet, but for all intents and purposes, the drain itself works. Yeah, if the clarifier was there, then we'd have a real nuisance on our hands because that would we just we would just have Alex out there with a shovel. Well, <laughs> okay. I've heard for children that your request to realign the barriers that we saw the slide of. Incidentally, that was a magnificent presentation that was very clear. I, I think that made everything very clear. Um, what can we do to reactivate their consideration of that? Because this is very critical, obviously. And the fact that they were there and now that they have denied them um, can uh, may have city council members go up and lobby, or what can the average individual do to request that they reconsider and approve the realigning of those? I don't know that there's anything that we can necessarily do to get them to reconsider. Their reason for denial of that particular project was that the state and the federal guidelines for this program does not allow for funding of maintenance projects. And they considered the cleaning those out and resetting those as the maintenance of existing structures. They, when I called to find out why they rejected it, they said, well, if you want to rephrase your application and to make it not look like it's a maintenance operation, you're welcome to resubmit. But that was an hour before the deadline for submittal. <laughs> so, first of all, I really didn't think I could wordsmith it into anything other than what it really was. You know, um, I lie and somebody swears to it, that's not going to work. Um, because in the end, then we'd get burned and end up having a violation of federal regulations to deal with. Um, and it just, it is what it is. It's a maintenance project and those simply aren't funded under that grant program. There are other ways that we will try to continue to get that funded, but the overall cost of that particular project was estimated at over $300,000. What about public works? Could they not take over there and put up some sort of stabilization <coughs> rails? Yeah, that, that's something our department would not get involved with. We would be focusing more on rail and timber structures, things like that, as, as far as trying to trap the sediment once it comes down, but nothing up on the hillsides like that. We don't even have the, the crews to even do, uh, try to even think about trying to take on a project like that. That's a, that's a very specialized kind of a project that's going to require some specialized training and equipment. To, um, the Con California Conservation Corps has been up there, they've looked at it, they've said they can do it, they gave me their estimate of what it would cost. They would actually have to go out there. They're buying motorized wheelbarrows to take that stuff out of there by wheelbarrow down Mount Wilson Trail. Uh, they're buying harnesses and ropes to hang themselves off the side of that mountain to do the work. That is just not something that any of us regular public agencies are trained or equipped to do. It's something that we're going to have to get some additional help with. And How effective are they? Well, let's say they were put up after the 78 fire, and um, I don't know that any homes have been seriously damaged um, or or lost because of stuff coming off that slope. Um, the answer to that, Bruce, is, is that no, none of them have. Right. There has been a tremendous amount of soil come down, as you're quite aware. Right. Yeah. To what we've seen, it was absolutely nothing. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me, can I get, yes. Yeah, I have a question. I live at 670 Skyland, and as Skyland comes down and makes a uh, kind of curve uh, down towards orange. There are three round metal plates in, in the street on a diagonal that say water. I am told that those holes were put there a long time ago for a mud flow that could come down and could be diverted by putting some kind of a barricade there, which would divert it uh, south on uh, Skyland instead of down on Fern. Is that, do you know anything about that? Because one of the neighbors that lived in the neighborhood for years and years told me about that, but I can't find anybody in the city that 
we would have to go out and pull those lids off of there because normally those those are valve we call those valve cans and normally those are lids on water valves and they could very well be valves under the underneath there and I'm not I know that intimately that. familiar with that part of the system to know. Okay. I know the answer to that. Firm lane was blocked on. Well, yeah, and, and a lot of you can see a lot of places up there where they work. Yeah. But that particular instance, I'm not familiar with. It wasn't here in '78. Yeah, but it was blocked up. It, it was it was blocked across there for a minute. Right. Other questions? Yes. It was post fire. Mm -hmm. That was the last time that area burned, was my understanding. Who, who paid for that in 1978? You know, we don't have much of any records on that. We've been we've been gleaning a lot of stuff out of newspapers. Uh, there was a volunteer that really took the lead and did a tremendous amount of work. Uh, his name is scattered all through the newspaper articles of the time. Um, he was a Forest Service employee that took a leave of absence from his job and actually headed up the, the efforts. He uh, was responsible for getting those those uh, bulkheads put up on the mountainside. Um, unfortunately, he's since passed away. We would love to have that expertise again. Any other questions? Yes. You referred to a grant that you said you always accepted the first round. Mm -hmm. How many rounds? Are There's there? basically two. We've, we've made it, we've got our foot in the door on that, that third application. It was actually the largest of the three uh, in terms of dollars. We've got our foot in the door. We now have between now and August 29th to put our full application together. We'll be working with the county to get the plan fully together to, to be able to get that application completed. The, the application is about this thick. It's not just slap a couple of paragraphs on a piece of paper. It's going to be a project. And in the meantime, does anything happen with regard to the project? Does the project not move until that application? Moves? No, we're going to keep working on it as, as much as we can, but we've got to, we've got to work the planning for the project at the same time we work the application. Okay. Any other questions before we turn it back to Mike? Okay. Daryl, ask me a question. <laughs> <laughs> Bring in another neighbor of ours, Mr. Mike McIntyre. Where's Mike? Come on up, Mike. He just speak to us. Bring up Lisa too. You You're gonna have yeah, dirt in the streets. You know, Chris does a great job. Uh, public works to get stuff out, but you may have to live with K rails, you know, in your front yard for a long time. The uh, San Anita fire um, um, at the turn of the century. Um, that was in New Year's, and so there was K-rails re redirecting mud through people's front yards and things like that, so it's going to be inconvenient. And there was a question about seating. Uh, that map, um, the rule of thumb is 35% slope or lower is seating, even to be effective, and the red is, indicates what's 30% and above. So as you can see, um, and Bruce was right, um, in, in the years past, we did, Seating just happened to make people feel good. And, and then they wouldn't wonder why all the grass grew down and the, uh, the gutters were down at the bottom of the hill. So. But um, <laughs> we didn't get too affected by it in terms of, you know, our property. Um, most of our stuff was burned on the upper part of the fire. And it'll have to go through the Sierra Madre and other to get down to the houses. But uh, we're all in this together. So, you know, whatever we can do to help. But uh, like everybody else, our, our resources are limited. <coughs> Yeah, it's the maintenance too. It's the maintenance of the sandbag. Sandbags are your own best defense. So you need to go out and make sure that they're not degrading and that you're keeping them up and keeping them in place. They do get ugly after a while. There's paint that you can paint on them, UV protection that will help keep them in place and keep them there longer. It's really important. They are ugly, but it's really important to leave them in place. And people get complacent over time. I, I lived through the old and grand Prix fires and people took stuff out and it was really a, a bad situation. So. I know where you're coming from. I know how frustrating it is to, to wait for things to happen and see how ugly it looks in the interim. But you know, nature sometimes heals things better than we do, as long as we're keeping up with what's going off the hillsides into the, the retention basin. 
If there's any questions. Will you see a problem starting to develop before anyone else? You mean because we're upstream? Yes. <coughs> you know what, I think that it's so steep up there, 60% slope on the, on the upper slopes that it's gonna, when it comes off, it comes off quickly. And, and you're gonna see actually the build up off for us down below where it starts sloping out um, towards the bottom of the, of the burn area before, before we would actually. In, in little increments above, right? And so it's those, those things bulk as it comes downstream. And, and we don't really have that many people up, yeah. up in our areas because it's more remote, yeah. steep areas. So um, you guys probably know more about it before we do. And then hydro mulching is similar to seeding, but you need to be really careful where you add it because you can add more bulk to what's coming down off the, off the mountain side. So it's really hard to add it because you add more bulk to what's coming down off the, off the mountain side. So, you know, if, you, if you do end up doing that, make sure you have good tack fire and if you have people applying it that have a lot of experience. I've seen whole hillsides wash off, wash off with, that have had hydro multiplied and then there's a bunch of newspaper in the backyard of people's homes that's all mushed up. So, you know, it's, it's a really hard thing to deal with and it's really hard to figure out what's the right thing to do. And I think this idea of doing the many different applications for different types of treatments is a really good approach. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you. Okay, the story has been presented to us. It's real. And I was given a very interesting phone call. There is a movement within this community, this town of Sierra Madre, to help the city of Sierra Madre getting funding to support the city and to help our neighbors who can in preparing for this coming rainy season. I did ask the California Fire Safety Council if we could extend our duties into this area. They said yes. They're all for it. So we're going to need more volunteers to help out. Bruce has his, his volunteer uh, sandbag gang to get started. He needs more help. We're organized. And the thing that is unique about the Fire Safety Council, we're a 501c3 nonprofit volunteer corporation. We can give you a nice tax deduction for your, your donation. And we have we are just now starting the plans to help getting more funds to help get some of these projects accomplished. So with that, I'd like to introduce Caroline Brown, our our, our director of public relations tell you more about our Red Flag Fire Report. Mr. Stolen was our guest speaker in February, which followed the first rains we had in January. The timing is never right. Um, the um, engineers from the LA uh, uh, County Department of Public Works spent three days in the canyon hillside areas identifying about 50 homes and leaving good engineering drawings for people. They were there during the week of the rain. But do you remember the Wednesday before the rain? It was the Wednesday, the first night of our um, um, farmer's market. People were down at yeah. the farmer's oh market looking gosh. back upon the foothills and thinking, who do we call? There's a fire. Well, it wasn't a fire. It was the windstorm that just blew all the ash, all the dust, everything around that wasn't hydrophobically waxed into place and it made me think there's the answer to people when they ask the question about seeding all that seeding that has been blown here there and everywhere else but the other stuff that has gone on research has been done as to how much seeding takes is taken away by the ants the rodents as well as the wind and the rains that never come exactly in the right amount at the right time so they sort of take root and much of the seed that's used isn't the type of seed that that does root work, that holds soils in place. And in fact, one of the biggest things that we are learning now from the California Department, uh, the University of California Agriculture Extension, is how to plant the right plants if you're going to do any planting at all, so you don't create fire fuels 10 or 15 years from now with garden escapes and so on and so forth, leaving your property. Um, Bruce knows his public works and the idea of flood, and he experienced an early event an out-of-season event, that there is really no season for this. Um, the idea of fatigue in preparation, I don't know, even someone tonight gave me a little idea about how to say it, but this into it. The um, um, 
earth, uh, the, the um, hurricane in Louisiana that we continue to listen to, when the hurricane season comes up again for these people, while all that was going on three years ago, the local newspapers were asking people, don't forget, if we'll come and we'll help you out with Hurricane Cindy. People go, what hurricane was that? Well, Hurricane Cindy came before Hurricane Dennis, which came before Hurricane Katrina, and then there was Hurricane Rita. We only hear about the last two. So Louisiana was experiencing what they call hurricane evacuation fatigue by the time Hurricane Katrina came around. And we're here tonight to try not to fatigue you with, you know, um, disaster preparedness, preparedness, but because you're having to look at two things at the same time. You're in this juggling match with yourself about flood preparation and the reflow diversion so you don't make, your, you know, so you can protect your property and not uh, inundate your neighbor's property. At the same time, knowing fully well we still have fire season, you know, lots of it ahead of us. Um, you get back on the freeway, you look back and you see a lot of land that did not burn. When you're up as close to it as we are, it looks like everything's burned because that's the slope aspect that you get to look at. It looks very burned. We are going to hold off on our red flag disaster, uh, red flag fire patrol training until more information comes to us from some meetings that are going on with the various uh, uh, agencies in the area, the Forest Service and the other communities. But before you leave tonight, if you have any interest at all in participating in the next training as it's when it, when and if, when, as soon as it's set up, rather, Please fill out one of these and leave it behind with us so that we can contact you. We'll have an active list of people who want to participate in the Red Flag Patrol. We did a lot of work in um, October and November with what the city told us to do, what the fire marshal told us to do when they got the Red Flag of, um, information from the weather agencies. Um, and it was an educational process to let people know why the trails were closed, why Chanter Flat Gate was closed for the time being. Not a, no one wants to keep people out of public lands. Public lands are for people to hike in and enjoy. But during certain times of the year, it's best that you stay out. Someone says, I'm a nice person. I'm not going to do anything up there. I says, it's easier to find the rascals if the nice people stay out. Mm -hmm. So it's never, it's never a good solution, but it's, it's one that works when it's necessary. So if you're interested, you need to get your name on the Red Flag Training Patrol. Mm -hmm. What are some of the activities that the patrol does? Basically, you, you go out and you look to see what the conditions are, and pay attention to people in the area, ask them to stay out of the area if the, if the uh, rail, uh, trails are closed. If some of the trails are, for example, the entire forest service, uh, forest street was closed, but it was, you, could, you were driving through, you could drive through on the roadways, public highways, but all the side areas were closed. You couldn't park your car and go on, on a hike, for example, even take a picnic off to the side of the road. Here in Sierra Madre, we have trailheads to close, if the city decides they want to do that, and the Chanter Flat Gate to close if the city decides to do that. Um, there's an eight mile stretch across the city from side to side where you go up and down all the canyons and just look and actually you all the are really just an extra pair of eyes out there to see that things are in good shape and nobody's out setting fires. Um, <coughs> someone who signed one earlier tonight and left pointed out at the last meeting that the fire started and it was on Chanty Flat Road, it was not a red flag fire alert because there was no wind predicted. And that's why the behavior of this fire was quite different as you heard Jay Lopez from LA County Fire last week talk, last month talk about it. But maybe a new part of it has to say if it's that hot, then the likelihood of a fire starting has another, you know, the air temperature was so hot, 100 degrees, and we can even though there was no, no wind. There were the other pieces of the fire quadrangle now, it's not just a fire triangle. Would that help to answer your question? Yes, so I saw some of the cars driving around town during the fire. Yes, what were we you went out during that period? talking to people, asking to, well, we, because we were really representing Sierra Madre Fire Safety Council, <coughs> talking to people and watching them begin to think about their evacuation plan. Okay. And um, we watched a lot of them just have parties. <laughs> but, there were people out there that were neighbors that I had talked to before that had come to our meetings in the past. And the whole idea is the educational process mm -hmm. to get people to appreciate it. I had started a, a map here about a year and a half ago and had people put red dots on the map if they had been through a fire evacuation and one of the people to put yellow dots if they hadn't been through a fire evacuation yet. Now that map's no longer applicable. You know, everybody gets to put on a red dot. So, any other questions? Caroline, I was just thinking like our um, neighborhood watch, mm -hmm. 
that we've done up on Chaparral. Well, why can't the, those that have done Neighborhood Watch mm -hmm. have uh, the Fire Safety Council or the um, or engineers come up and look at our road in particular to guide us? Maybe it would apply to other roads, especially in the canyon, mm -hmm. to help us correctly lay um, or have laid um, our sandbags because it could be disastrous, like you said, to point them and annihilate the neighbor. And, and, and because there's leaders on each road, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought, you know, that might be a way to, uh, we'd have to what, call Bruce for um, a referral of, of who would come out to your meeting and walk you through your, down, up and down your street and, and guide us on how you do uh, sandbagging. I think right now why you have received that information is you're not threatened yet by a mother's grief board. Right. You have been in the past, however. Do you remember oh, when sure. you came across from Kinaloa? Exactly. Well, you want to do it, unfortunately, a sandbag are kind of ugly, but you better get prepared. We don't know when another, mm -hmm. the rain and the weather, the way it's so unpredictable, especially now. Mm -hmm. You could have another <coughs> potential rain. And you know, they're looking at each piece of it, though, as an, as an event. You haven't had the fire right on top of you, so that mother debris report really isn't an immediate threat. But what you're saying is absolutely true, because you have a history of previous experiences. And the red, um, in the red flag fire patrol, anybody participates in oh, yeah. the city of Seattle, mm -hmm. and these, these units that are in place already, such as the neighborhood watch, will be essential in, in all of these neighborhood acts. Any other questions? Give me, give me one last, one last request. It comes from the state of California. How many of you are aware that Shetland Flats is in zip code 91024? It is. Shetland Flats is in zip code 91024. We have a media event next Thursday at uh, that will be June 12th at 9:30 in the morning. It's a check presentation like the one we had in front of Mary Ann McGillery's house two years ago. This check is a little bit bigger. It's $150,000 from Farmers Insurance. It goes to the state of California. They like to have as many people there as possible so that we can show that how we work as an actual community, helping, helping each other. They're going to bring out the actual pack train. Your, your, your bottle of water will be delivered by the pack train. And this will be a, a real major event. They were asking for as many people as they possibly can to, to come. And just remember, the federal government has given us, is in, is in the process of giving us $48,000 for our chipping program to start this coming winter for, ex, for the removal of excess fuel. They've asked for us to have a good presentation there. This is where I, I need your help. And our, last, our next meeting will be after the, the, uh, the July 4th parade. That will be on Monday, July 7th. And it will be pertaining to the Red Flag Patrol if everything goes well. With that, thank you all for coming. Is there any questions? Yes, can questions. You, can you give that date and, and time again? It will be next Thursday, July, June 12th at 9.30 in the morning, Chetra Flats. Parking will be limited. April. Uh, yes, the big media rollout for the Great Southern California Shakeout will be Wednesday morning at Caltech. And in the aftermath of the seminar that we just did at Cooper Auditorium uh, last May 27th, we've been asked to do it again on June 18th. So uh, for those of you who are interested, there will be an opportunity to attend that free seminar, Cooper Auditorium at City of Hope Hospital on June 18th. That meeting was outstanding, well attended, and it's well for everybody to attend. The Great Thank Shakeout you. is also anticipating up to 1,600 and possibly more fires in the aftermath of that earthquake. Any other questions? Yes. I'm thinking I haven't spoken to anyone yet. Our school does a service club where the kids try to find things to do. I heard, actually, I was at another meeting after school, and I saw those volunteer sandbags. 
is that something maybe I can have the kids do one, Bruce? one day a month and just have a pack of, and I say kids, they're middle school and high school kids. High school kids? No, I don't know. Let's have Bruce answer that question. And just have a stack of sandbags that people can come and pick up that I, I don't know. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first part of the question. I am thinking, I haven't spoken to Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Be sure to sign up. I appreciate it for coming. I hope you enjoyed this.